I'd like you to lift your two hands to the ultimate Father, our Lord and Savior. Bless him this morning. He's the Father of all fathers. He's our pattern example. He's the one we look like. He's the one that is our source. Let's celebrate the ultimate Father, our Lord and our Maker, our Redeemer, our strength, our God in whom we live and move and have our being. Somebody celebrate the Father of all fathers. We worship you, Jesus. We ascribe glory. We ascribe honor. We ascribe praise. We celebrate Jesus. We celebrate Jesus. We honor you, our God. We magnify you. You are the reason for today. We bless you, we bless you, we bless you, we bless you. A maker and a redeemer, we come with total adoration. Not just as men, but as a whole congregation. To decree and to declare, there is no father like you dependable, trustworthy, ever abiding, ever faithful, never absent, always providing, always instructing, always directing. You even gave your life for us. We love you, Father. We love you. Tonight, as today as we celebrate Father's Day, we draw strength from you. We draw wisdom from you. Speak to us in this service. Let your word find free course. We celebrate you and you alone. Even as you honor us, your children. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Come on, put your hands together for him one more time. Before you sit down, high five five people, hug somebody, shake them. Welcome to your father's house. It's good to have you this morning. Welcome to church. Welcome to church. Hallelujah. Amen. You may please be seated. Hallelujah. I want to congratulate every man in this house. By that, I mean every male man, every man in the house. I want to congratulate every one of you because possibly the most endangered assignment on earth is fathering. So much so because the enemy knows quite well that all that needs to happen for the world to stand right side up is for fathers to be truly what they are supposed to be. That's why when Pastor Stephen Omoju Igbe was speaking yesterday, he was so spot on, was so accurate. You know, he did it in a, such a profound way. He showed us a movie clip thriller to be precise of the Lord of the Rings trilogy and uh, from there he drew three profound lessons about being a father and one of it said evil will haunt him the devil has been doing so much to try and afflict fathering because he knows that once fathers take their position everything gets all right. And that is why anything to celebrate fathering or fathers or fatherhood is something the church as a custodian of the, of, the, of, the, of the truth, of the mind of God should not take for granted. And I celebrate what uh, Mrs. Okocha said when she said the truth of the matter is that it's so easy uh, not to I mean, to, to me celebrating who a father is. Uh, and I sincerely think today that 
The fathers in the house deserve celebration. If you don't mind, can I ask every lady in the house to just stand as the men remain seated and let's put our hands together for all the fathers. Come on, celebrate them. Put your hands together. Put your hands together. If you've ever had a father, celebrate one. Hallelujah. And if you don't mind, can you look around and just blow them a kiss? Happy Father's Day. Hallelujah. Amen. We may please be seated. Thank you, wonderful mothers and ladies. Um, that is not to say you won't do what is necessary later. Buy them gifts, take them out and take them in for those who are married. <laughs> Hallelujah to Jesus. Praise the Lord. All right, I want to speak on the making process. The making process. The making process. The thing for this conference has been the God made man. And on Friday, um, Pastor K and Pastor Ejogu from, you know, invited speaker, you know, came with some profound dimension while leading us into intercession. And they highlighted some very powerful things. And um, Saturday morning, that's why Pastor Peter said the tapes would be available. And let me direct it this way, um, tape and sound. The moment I'm done with this message, add it to those three messages. So start preparing the first two, um, Friday night, Saturday morning. If I Saturday, two sessions, including a medical session, and this one, make it four, put it in MP3 format, and duplicate as many as you can, so that between when the message is over and when we share the grace, we still have a few things to do. Let's see how many we can line up, okay, for men to take. And if we can't finish today, uh, let others collect on Wednesday. Is that okay? Good. All right. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1. Genesis chapter number 5. The making process. The making process. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1. Can you put that up? Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1. And this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created what? Man. In the likeness of God made he him. You know, as I was studying for this, a number of things flooded my mind. Let me ask a question and I need answers. If you are invited and they put three cars on the floor and they said this one, three SUVs, this one is made by Tata. Tata is an Indian company, number one. Number two, this one is made by, um, let's say Dewu. Dewu is a South Korean company. And the third one is made by Toyota, a Japanese company. Which one will you choose? Huh? Toyota. Everybody seems to say the same thing. Let me ask another question. You go to the pharmacy to buy a medicine, cough medicine, and they say this one is made by Emzo of Nigeria. This one is made by Bicham of the United Kingdom. And the third one is made by Jawalala of India. Which one will you choose? Bicham, why are we all saying the same thing? Finally, you go to buy a shoe. They say this one is made by Namsko of Abba. The second one is made by Selato of Republic of Benin. And the third one is made by Ferragamo of Italy. Which one will you choose? Italian shoe. <laughs> Abba <Quenu. laughs> All right. Now, it is interesting how everybody will make the same choice. So the question is why? Because I know that Nigerian compounded medicine is more effective for Nigerians than European compounded medicine. 
I know that to be a fact. Because the FDA in America, the Food and Drug Administration of America, have a standard of offering, for instance, let me start with the basic analgesics, pain tablets, at its lowest possible level. In order not to complicate people or to give room for all the lawsuits that are possible. When you take Nigerian Panadol, ah, it's different from Tylenol and all those other ones. That, the same uh, uh, major compounds, but it doesn't deliver the same effect. Do I have a witness here? And that's a fact. But we instinctively will go for the one made from not because, and ladies and gentlemen, you want to agree with me, it's not because we don't love our nation. It's not that, is it because we want our monies to go somewhere? It's just that somehow, those other ones have been able to establish a reputation of superior products. I'm here to submit to you that if man can take notice of the superiority of the product done by other men and nations. I believe that every God-made man, people should take notice of you. They should. Because as I probed further and tried to ask the obvious or the evident, the question is, why? Why do you prefer Bicham to Jawalalal of India or Emzolin of Nigeria? or Namsko, of Abba, or any of those stuff. Why? Because you know that the process that they take those production through, they won't cut corners, they won't sort, you know, short change, they will not mix things or dilute it. The process is rigorous. The, progress, the, the process is, is consistent. So you can go to bed, close your eyes, literally speaking, because you are sure that if it came through this particular organization or nation because of standards, you are sure that what you are getting is what you are bargaining for. And that's exactly what the Spirit of the Lord laid upon my heart. That when it comes to the making process of a man, if we understand from the first scripture we read in Genesis chapter 5 verse 1, that it is the prerogative, it is the mind and mandate of God to make men, and we allow ourselves to be made, certain things will be the inescapable conclusion. The whole world will celebrate us. Can I have an amen? amen. Let me show you two examples. I'm trying not to get too much ahead of me. If you jump to the scriptures, look at two examples. Let's start from 2 Chronicles chapter 26. In 2 Chronicles chapter 26, look at verse 5. Very quickly, put it up. I want to show you two quick examples of men that God made and see their outcomes. So that from their conclusions, we can go back to the beginnings. Can I have every man only, men only in the house? Let me hear you read this scripture with me. Everybody to go. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. God made him. Every God made man prospers. Every God made man cannot fail. God made him and therefore he prospered. Listen to me. Every product from Bicham, every product from those nations or companies, people buy them, they can close their eyes and buy them. Their prices may be more because they know the person that made them. I want to prophesy upon every man in this house. As we yield and submit ourselves to God like Zechariah, may we prosper. May the world celebrate us. May the world stand to salute us. That amen can be louder this morning. That's why we must subject ourselves to the making process. One more example. Look at Genesis 45. In Genesis chapter 45, two verses, verse 8 and 9. 
Before I zero in on, on that, that main focus, the making process. In Genesis chapter 45, this time around, if you don't mind, I'd like to hear the women's voices only. Verses 8 and verse 9. Can I have all the women ring very loud to go? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes. The next verse, verse 9. Yes. 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 And tarry not. Amen. Joseph said, come and see what God has made me into. I'm not just an important person. I am father even to the king of the land. He said, tell my father that the making process has reached a point where the world can celebrate me. Saints, the end product is not in doubt. The challenge is how many are ready to subject themselves to the process. You know, every time you go to a factory of any type, it's rough. I mean, let's take maybe the most common, common place, a furniture workshop. Every time you go to a furniture workshop, and you see the processes a skilled carpenter would take different uh, woods through in order to bring them to what is called a showroom of display the rough edges the shaping, the sharpening the nailing the painting the pummeling the squeezing the coloring if the wood has an opportunity to complain and to cry out it would cry out it would refuse it. But not until the wood is brought out in display and people begin to come and admire. Some can only get, they can afford it. Some can only touch and wish they can own it. Some, we have to go back and ask more money from friends and neighbors to be able to put it together just to buy it. Why? The same piece of wood that ordinarily would have been meant only as a firewood. It's not a thing of beauty, of value, of admiration to the degree that people are coming to see, taking pictures and sending it and saying, this will feed this, this will feed that. That is what it means to go through the making process of life. And I really want to talk to the men in the house from my heart. I know I don't have all the time, but I'm going to speak as quickly as I can and hoping that the Lord will help every one of us. Listen. The Bible says, for the sake of the joy that is set ahead. For the sake of the time of display in the workshop, in the showroom. For the sake of the time where like a Joseph, you can announce to your kids and kin, your children, your tribesmen, your former schoolmates, your colleagues, say, come and see what the Lord has made me into. That was the message of Joseph. He said, go tell my father. Go call my father. The story is no longer the same. A professor, in this one life, you will end on that note. Can I have that amen ring a little bit louder? Say, come and see, God has made me a father. How can a stranger come from afar and father other people? What will make other men submit to a man? What will make you to be the solution to your generation? An answer to everybody. What is the making process of a man? What does a man need to go through to arrive at that certain bus stop? What is it? You will agree with me that there is no shortcut in life. Every shortcut cut short your destiny. It does. Mrs. Alagbe, Fumi Alagbe was so profound when she said, you know, in that a small brief talk show, a show that every time we deny people the invaluable lessons, we are only postponing the day of examination. They ultimately fail. Somebody said to me some time ago, he said, how come women, mothers, not women, mothers complain 
of, of poorly trained husbands only to train their sons to replicate the exact thing. Have you noticed that very often times it's not even the fathers that spoil the sons, it's oftentimes the mothers. Say it's a man living. They complain of husbands who are not responding properly and they train their sons to be exactly like their fathers. Say, ah, ah, don't you know he's a man, you come and do this, ah, leave him now, he's a man, leave him, and all of that. So the, the challenge is not that we don't know. God help me with this thing today. But if I trip, just know it's under the anointing. <laughs> I'm wearing it by force. You know, this is not my style. <laughs> now, are we still together? So, the truth is, it's, not, it's important we recognize the processes and deliberately subject ourselves to it. There's so much to talk about, but I'm just going to zero in on what makes a product comes out as a man? And at the end of the day, he doesn't just become a local champion, he becomes a global icon. He becomes a figure to be respected, to be admired. He becomes somebody to be desired. He becomes somebody that everybody pursues and wants to get connected to. He becomes an answer, not just to a nation, but to the entire world. What is the process? Saints, God said in Genesis 5.1, let us make man. A man cannot arrive, he is made. A man cannot happen, he must go through process. Anything you leave to itself or as a man to grow without nurturing, without doctoring, without grooming, without processes, will be a disaster waiting to happen. Um, Pastor Stephen Omojuigbe was saying on Saturday, 99% of rapes are committed by men. 80% of armed robberies. The statistics goes on. These are men born by women. They have fathers, they have mothers, they have siblings, they have kith and kin. How is it possible for a man to turn out that way? Here is the making process. I want to use the story of Joseph. There are so many of it. Uh, there are so many points, but I'll see how many I can do and i stop. For a man to arrive at that position where he becomes a paragon of beauty and at a, a, a standard to be admired, there are certain things he has to go through. And listen to me, whether it's by design or by default, is all part of it. Let me quickly add that God is, is intentional, but it's not necessarily linear or, 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 or predictable in his pattern. God can choose to use any route, any way, any means to not only bring us into shape, but cause us to get to. So some of you that complain of, I didn't have a father figure, or I didn't have this, or they have that, it has not stopped God. From making up. By the time I'm through, you will see that you can glean each of these processes from dimensions of your life. Because the things we go through in life either make us better or better. The choice is ours. For instance, here are the, are the things God takes us through. The first one I like to start with from Genesis chapter 37, from verse 5 to 11, is a long passage, so we can't read it all. Is what I call the, the trial. Of vision, the test of vision, if you will, the demand of vision. Genesis chapter 37, verse 5 to 11. One of the most essential foundation for any person that will be made is to have and own a vision for life. Because your vision for life will determine the extent to which you will submit yourself. One of the things I found out in life is that some people are satisfied with poverty. Some others are rebelling against poverty. Some rebel against status quo. It's a question of the visions of their heart. 
Joseph attained the height of eminence because he had a dream that was eminent. It is the, the ability to subject yourself to a demand is determined by the height you set for yourself. Listen carefully. Listen well. Men, follow me. When you see a Ronaldo, you know, the footballer, after training is over and goes to take additional hours of training, he has a vision. He sees something or something is pursuing him. Am I communicating? When you see a man who, who is doing some things, ask him first, what has he seen? Because what you see determines your response system. Everything Joseph went through was because of his vision. So the first thing to do when God wants to make a man is to put a picture in his heart. Put a picture in the heart and say, son, let this picture govern your life. What do you want to be? In any field, there are first class, second class, third class, and 100 class. Every man chooses what he wants to be. As, 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 as a leader, you employ five cleaners. Cleaners. You look at them, you can see the one that is going somewhere, and you see the one that are going where? Nowhere. True or false? Cleaners. What's the difference? It's vision. I may be here today, but what I see is so big, I can't remain here. So that conditions your character and attributes to life. I went to the bank. Then it was a Shenick bank many years ago. I've told this story over and over. Let me tell it again. On um, Tiamu Savage, close to GT. And I think my driver, or I can't remember his staff, went in and I remained in the car. And I saw that the bank asked this young lady, it's about four or five of them, to go out and take out the weed that was planted in between the interlocks, the, the paving stones. And I was interested. So I sat in the car, I was at the back. I watched these four or five ladies. Three of them complaining, nail complaining, you know, all kinds of things. I noticed that one of the girls bent down throughout walking. The other one was trying to say, Mona, walk now. I said, ah, maybe this one we can't do. I clean, we can't clean. I sweep, we can't sweep. And the one, I couldn't help it. I wound down my glass. And I said, excuse me. Of course, the ones that were not busy were the first one that were about to come. I said, not you. <laughs> not you. The other one that's kneeling, bending down. And the young lady walked to me. And I said to her, what is your name? She told me, I can't even remember it, what it is now. I said, how much do they pay you? She said, I go home with 12000 every month. That was then. I said, you know what? You just end yourself a job. As I left there, I called a friend of mine who was running a restaurant. I said, I just found you somebody you would thank me for. I need you to employ him now. He said, consider it done. So I called the lady that evening. I said, report in so-so-and-so place the next day. She started with 30000 in a new place, they moved that to 45,000 thereafter. And later, my friend, Prince Okongo, called me and said, that lady became a supervisor in their district. She has left the others who are still cleaning and complaining at the low level. I didn't get a chance to ask her, you know, question. I never saw her. If you ask the lady, why are you different from these other women? You're all women, you have the same job. Somebody say vision. It's what you see. What you see that determines. So, when you see a man like, like Pastor Stephen Omoju Igbe said, drive in the evening to Queen Amina Hall in Unilak, waiting for an 18-year-old girl to carry home. As a, you know, you need to help me ask him, what are you seeing? What are you looking for? What are you seeing? When you see a man who wakes up in the morning with diligence, Gets his family going. Gets himself going. Busies himself with the work. Something is driving him. There are some other men who want to sleep till 10 a.m. Wake up yawning and say, God, give it his beloved sleep. It's a good day. What is the difference? Vision. Vision. 
There are young men who are employing their mates. Talk to me. Who are, who are, somebody tells them it can't happen. They say, no, it can't happen because of the visions of their heart. Time will fail me. There's so much to talk about. But let me wrong. The second one is a test of responsibility. A test of responsibility. The morning tells the day. The child tells the man. As you make your bed, so you will lie on it. Things don't happen overnight. The secret of your future is found in the minute details of your habits today. How responsible you are today can show, can tell. I know people change. Those are exceptions. I'm talking about the general rule. The secret of your routine today is a picture of where you will happen tomorrow. Check Joseph. At the age of 17, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 37 verse 2, he was among those keeping the family business. Later in life, he was the one that was sent to take his food to his brothers. If you read the story, it's so easy to gloss over familiar story. The Bible says, he went to the place where his father said his brothers would be. When he got there, they were not there. What would an average teenager do? Go back home. But Joseph said, no, I am on an assignment. Until it is completed, you don't go back. So he did what a smart, responsible young man would do. Where did you see any people walking here? He kept asking until somebody Yes, it's like they've gone to Dothan. I wanted to calculate the distance, but I didn't get a chance to go online and plot the distance. Possibly it was the next community or it was far off. And they told him Dothan. There was no assurance there in Dothan. But as a responsible young man, he carried the food. He didn't open to eat part of it. Went to his brothers. Located them. Responsibility. You jump. Came to Pharaoh, Potiphar's house. A, a slave that you should be suspecting. Because many of us have stewards and gardeners and guards and all kinds of people. Who always think they are smart when they are shortchanging you. Only fools do those things because at the end of the day, your master not only has the capacity to bless you, but the bigger master, God Almighty, who determines where you will be, is watching your sense of what? Responsibility. The master said, I've never found a servant like you, so everything in this house, govern it at your word. He went to the palace, I mean to the prison. The same spirit of responsibility. The head guard said, wow, is such a man as you. Help me take charge of the prison. Responsibility. He went to Pharaoh's palace. Pharaoh said, this entire kingdom will be ruled at your world. Why? He was a pattern for him. He was responsible. He was a self-starter. The reason he was responsible was not trying to please any man. He was driven by revision. He was driven by revision. Saints, can I admonish? The making process of a man is to make them responsible. Do stuff. You know, as, as the debate was going on, some of us need to examine some things we do actually. As a, as a, as a final year, Law student, I used to go with my father to the farm. I went with my father to the farm. You know, my father was in the police force, retired. The height he went to was just as an inspector. That's a junior officer. So he wasn't a man of much means. So he took to farming initially as pastime, but pastime became something good. And he would get us. I remember how, you know, he would wake us up, myself and my immediate elder brother, one is either sweeping the compound, the other one is cleaning the car. And my dad used to have a habit, once it's 5 a.m., he can't sleep anymore. One day I asked him, I said, what kind of a man are you? Five is when the sleep is sweet now. What's your problem? He wakes up early in the morning. He told me the story of how he used to have to go and sell for his mother, you know, all the distance, come back before he can go to school. And all of that. So he tried to instill that. Now, what made me to be able to do that even as a law student and final year? That's the, that's the, that's the height of strategic posing. Don't you? Law student was because in church we were taught early. 
that you must serve your fathers. If I will never forget what Mrs. Osamere said to us in Children Church many years ago, he said, I don't care the state of your father or the state of your mother. No other person is better qualified to father you or be your mother than your biological father and mother. And the thing stuck in our memory. And we're taught to honor our parents. But what's the point? The point is that those kind of responsibilities start very early. I remember a few things I was subjected to. You know, I had an older sister, the one that came during my 20th, our 20th anniversary. She lived in England with her husband for many years. When she came back, my mother said, no, I can't send a house. Said, you go and serve them. So I served the whole house for about two, three years. Cleaned the dishes, cleaned the entire house. You know, that's where I got heavily domesticated. You know, do the market runs, do all kinds of things. Before I could go to school, I was attending afternoon secondary school. I would wake up with them, do all of it for three years. No, I was complaining, no. <laughs> Have you seen a teenager who does not complain? <laughs> we better tell the truth. <laughs> but the point is, that responsibility imbued some values in me. Built some values in me. My mother was, an, was, an, was, was, an, was a distributor of eggs, major distributor. So when I returned from that, serving my sisters, you know, and, and her family, and I went back, you know, towards my last two years of secondary school, every morning, I must go help my mom load, I mean, I can't, they used to have these pickup vans that come and carry these eggs to the north. And I was a leader, I was a chief loader. Carry a wheelbarrow and roll the thing and load the thing every day. Every day. And you were expected to get to school on time. You are not permitted to fail. Your uniform must be speak and span. Everything must be in place. Of course, house help, who does monkey banana? You do everything yourself. Now, I didn't appreciate those things then until later, at an early age, God gives you a mandate to pioneer a work and do so many things. And the responsibility you built over time begins to show on you. Whereby there is no kind of job others are doing you can't do. What am I saying? God has a way. Knowing, like I said, I didn't enjoy it. I complained and all of that. But thank God nobody listened to my complaints. Because when the making process is on, oftentimes it's not joyous like the Bible says. But it worked some, 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 some gifts, some some opportunities and some things. Why was Joseph trusted to take care of not just the kingdom, the whole world? He took care of family business. He took care of prison business. He took care and was faithful in the business of his, of his master, Potiphar. And God said, you have shown that you are responsible. Promotion is awaiting you. Can I have an amen? Number three, very quickly, the test of hardship. The test of hardship. The Bible never said, if you go through. The Bible says, what? When. Help me preach to anybody around you. It's a, it's a matter of time. There is a season called hardship. It's coming. We, we leave. My wife, was, my wife was sharing with me something I felt was profound. One of her lecturers in the program she's going through said, it is we pastors and Christians that are responsible for the problem in the church today. We teach and preach like as if there are no seasons at which people go through some kinds of things. Meanwhile, the Bible is very clear. The Bible is very clear. So when people not go through some of those seasons, some of them are ready to give up, deny the faith, or do all kinds of crazy stuff to get by. To, to triumph in those seasons. And it is wrong. Here is what Jesus says. He said, in the world, you shall have tribulation. That English is too archaic. In the world, you shall have plenty trouble. That's what Jesus said. He said, but be of good cheer. You shall overcome. From the Old Testament to the New Testament. One of the scriptures, Psalm 34 verse 19. The Bible says, many, somebody say many, are the afflictions of the righteous. 
But the Lord does what? From what? Out of them. So you don't concentrate on the seasonal problem, but on the ultimate triumph. It will come. Now, why, why is hardship necessary? Listen to me. Hardship reveals character. Hardship doesn't impact character. It reveals character. It reveals your weakness. It reveals your weakness and your strength. You know whether a man is honest when he doesn't have money and there's an opportunity to steal and he refuses to steal. That's when you know when you are honest. I've told you before, when it comes to humility, a poor man cannot say I'm humble. There's only one thing a poor man should be, and that's what? Humble. You have to be humble if you are poor. You have to be, no, some people don't like me when I say it, but it's the truth. We don't know who you are. Hardship reveals. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. Jesus was on the cross in the excruciating realization of the weight and the pain he was carrying. The despite of God the Father. The abandonment of everybody that was somebody. And in the midst of that, because of purpose, vision, because of vision, he said, Father, do what? Forgive them. For what? For they don't know what they are doing. Now, why? Hardship is where we finally determine whether you are ready for glory that is to come. Not in a place of plenty or prosperity. When you go through hardship, when as a servant of God, you are praying for people that are getting breakthrough, they are carrying the fruit of the womb, and you lack the fruit of the womb for years. God is watching your character. Whether you go into regret, or you you will be you 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 will be you will be accusing God for sin when things are not working when they are delayed. I was saying to a young man recently. He said, Pastor, permit me to be out of church for a season until I get things right. I said, No. I said, If you seek God only when things are fair, then mark my word, God can never trust you for great things because everybody can celebrate God when things are going well. The true worshippers are those who worship him in season and out of season. People who when everything says, put down your hands, they raise their hands and bless God. Those are the ones that God honors. I said, you are not impressing anybody to arrive back in church like a celebrity. God knows those who truly love him. I said, this time you are going through hardship. This is the time you put that devil to shame. And I gave him a key. I said, listen to me. You want to accelerate your promotion? Seek God when things are tough. Don't stay out of fellowship. Man, God has promised us there will be hardship. There will be hardship. But the hardship is not meant to drown us. I've told you that before. A British writer, A-U-G-L-E-Y, ugly, that's his name. He said, God often draws men into deep water. Not to drown them, but to cleanse them. The deeper the waters you are drawn into, it shows that God really wants to cleanse you and purge you. Joseph went through, how can a man with a vision of glory start with humiliation? When I read the story, listen carefully, listen carefully. I, I, I'll try and wrap up quickly because of my time. Listen to this. Do you know are you with me? After Joseph went through the pain of locating his brothers, they carried Joseph, put him in the, when he was coming, they said, here comes the dreamer. Let's seize on him, kill him, and see what will become of his dreams. They put him in the, in the pit. Guess what? After putting him in the pit, they sat down by the pit and ate the food he brought. I mean, <laughs> human beings are deep. They could eat that food. And I can imagine them belching and say, what a delicious food. And the man who brought it was in the pit. Excuse me, what do you think Joseph was doing in the pit? He was shouting, please don't do this. I am your brother. Please don't do this to me. Consider that I brought the food you are eating. Please. What do you think they were saying? Shut up there. You're not even happy that Reuben said we shouldn't kill you. If you talk more, we'll come and kill you. Please, Judah. Please, 
Simon, don't do this to me, please. Remember, he was just 17 years of age. So, here's where I'm going. That is enough to permanently injure the, the mind of somebody. To, to destroy every virtue inside. It's a no pain. It's a no pain to say, ah, uh, ah, uh, is this what it means to be a good person? Is this what it means to be kind? I should have just gone back in Dawson. I will stop helping people. Look at what my father's assignment has brought me to. Look at what being kind. But do you notice that not once was the character of Joseph changed. The first assignment as he got to the part, to Potiphar's house demonstrated the kind of character he was made of. Are we still together? And what was it? Honesty, hard work, diligence, forthrightness, and commitment. Another test was the test of integrity. Can I read you a scripture? I'm selecting the things I'll talk about and close. Go with me to Genesis chapter 39. Look at verse 10. Genesis 39. The making process. Saints, may we pass all the tests in the making process. That your image can be better. Can you read this with me? Can I hear the men? Just the men. I like that baritone voice. I like the ring and the sound. Can we read it together to go? Day by day that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. You know, when we read that story, there's a tendency to think it was a one-off event. No. The Bible does not tell us how long. But the Bible says it was what? Day by day. Excuse me. Every day, a beautiful damsel, or God was not at home. So, hey, this man was the captain of the guard, was Potiphar. I hope you have known by now that big men like to marry precious and beautiful women. If you have not noticed, start checking out. This woman was a ravishing beauty. And because her guy was not at home, you can imagine all the seductive appearance. It's her house. Her guy is not home. Just to get at the end. The Bible says, every day, lie by me. Take the pleasure of sleeping with me. Do you know what I can offer you? Every day, we're not told how long, and Joseph talked to his God. What I see is bigger than this temporary pleasure that you're offering me. Saints, please, men, listen to me. In the world, they say every man has a price. Offer them the right price, they will capitulate. Are there men who can tell them you are lying? Not every man can be sold. Are the men in the house today? Not for this. Hey, is it because Joseph cannot sire children or because he was, he was a, a eunuch? No. Later he got married and had children. But he was a man. He passed the test of integrity. That time he was announcing, come and see what God has made me. It is this process. Ladies and gentlemen, whatever be the past, mistakes and errors. Now, mothers, friends, you know, some, some men have made mistakes in the past. But I'm talking of from now going forward. Let's be men of integrity. Men who will not be sold. Men who cannot be bought. Men like Joseph. Morality in the place of relationship with the opposite sex. Discretion in official matters, in all kinds of things, was proof of where he was headed to. Ladies and gentlemen, those who compromise end up cutting short their destinies. That's what happens. What's the making process? I'm here to announce to you that God saw Joseph when Joseph was being tempted. 
God has never and will not remove the temptation from the way. God is not a tempter. Satan is a tempter. But God will not remove the temptation. Because he will allow the temptation in order to watch what kind of person you are. In order for him to determine where to put you. How many of you know that if Joseph had started that day, it would never end? Am I communicating? When our political leaders have office, when I was in Unibet, I had a classmate in the law faculty. He was a military man, serving military man. Because it was a military regime, then he was the one that was given the job to recruit teenagers to sleep with these men. So they would come with cars. They used to do it then, so you can imagine it's a, it's a different thing now. And I'm told that the guests used to scramble to be among those that would be taken to sleep with these perverts for particular amounts they will be paid. Some of them need two, they need three, they need four per night. Where do you think it started from? If Joseph did it in Potiphar's wife and he now became prime minister of the land, what do you think would have happened? As a slave, he did it. Now he now has power and authority. What do you think would have happened? Because positions are not the reason people change. Positions only create opportunity to manifest the lack of integrity and irresponsibility that was already there. A pastor does not misbehave because promotion has come. Promotion can only aid, can only facilitate. What you used to do in secret, now you can buy tickets and arrange. Because means have come. Saints, for people that will endure, there are certain attributes. Let me run, quickly run. Another test that, that Joseph went through in the making process was the test of selflessness. Every God-made man is made anointed as an instrument, as a warrior, as somebody that God wants to use to honor his name and image as a man. So what does God do? He puts in you gifts, abilities, and causes you to have opportunities to use it to bless others. Joseph was a specimen of sacrificial selflessness. All true. I just couldn't understand a man such as him. In the same way, that is why at the end of the day, God honored him and promoted him. Check his life. From serving food, to serving Potiphar, to serving the prisoners, interpreting dreams. The same dream interpretation that brought him to the prison. He never stopped doing good. Can I advise you? There are many of you in this hall looking at me. People have taken advantage of your good. Made you look like a fool when you helped them. And sometimes, the funny things about people when they are cheating you is that they actually believe they are smarter than you. Let me warn you. If you change your attitude of being good because people messed you up, you reduce your rise in life. Let them want to cheat you as often as they can. Yes, develop wisdom. But what you should pray for is that may God always make you their source instead of their dependent. Did you hear what I said? The reason they want to get from you is because you have better than them. So let them remain at that level. You be the one supplying. Let them be the cheap cheats. Or you remain the ones. Don't change your attitude because people change. People are not your source. Am I communicating? Remain good to them. Remain kind. That was the Joseph selflessness, sacrificial nature. Finally, his brothers came. If you read to Genesis chapter 45, his brothers came. He said, oh, my brothers. The human kindness. He went aside and wept. He said, give them enough food. Give them enough food. 
That is a good time for somebody to say, do me, I do you. God, not the, not the universe. An eye for an eye, the whole world soon gets what? Mahatma Gandhi. No, that's cheap. That's not a leader. That's not a God-made man. A God-made man understands that somebody pays the price. And he actually said it to his brothers. In fact, he said in, in, in that Genesis chapter 45 from verse 8, he said, God is the one that sent me to preserve lives. Am I communicating? He was selfless to the end. What was his final act? A man who remembers that the reason for promotion is not for self. He went to the king Pharaoh and said, my joy will be incomplete if I'm enjoying and my people are suffering. I wish you can have politicians who get into office and know they came from a people. I wish you can have leaders, men, who get into the office and remember that in their village there are some children who can't go to school because they can't pay 10,000 naira. Joseph said, Pharaoh, do me the last favor. My people, my people. I can't withstand it for my people to be suffering when I have capacity to help the world. Do me that favor. And Pharaoh said, you have helped everybody. Helping your people will be an easy thing. Go bring them. And Joseph sent a message saying, everybody pack them. That's how they entered into Egypt. His demand and his character and force were so solid that they gave them a whole city, the city of Goshen. Say, so you go there and stay. But guess what? To know the kind of man Joseph is, eventually before he died, I'm fast forwarding a lot of things. He said, my people, God will visit you. Say, so when you leave this land, carry my bones. Because I may be doing well here, but I know the ultimate destination. It's not this place. A God-made man, no matter the acquisition, attainment, acquirement, no matter the, the results on this earth, never loses fact of the fact that there is a better place to come. Am I communicating? That's why a God-made man is different from a self-made man. He said, my people, God will visit you. He said, but don't leave my bones in Egypt. Some years ago, I did a message. I titled it, The Prophetic Bones of Assurance. Do you know what jo Joseph did? Joseph's people did? When they were finally leaving, they carried a coffin. I called it The Bones of Assurance. They dug up the grave of Joseph, carried the bones put in the box. And I can imagine, say, two men carried these bones. And when they are asked, what are these bones? He says, the assurance that God is taking us somewhere. This man's prophesied and it has come to pass. So every time the wilderness experience is troublesome, all they need to do is just see the bones. God is still with us. Am I communicating? Let me give you one or two more points as I close. Is there any man close to you? Tell him you are a God-made man. You are not a self-made man. Do me a favor, look for two more. Tell them you are God-made. You are not a self-made man. Can you prophesy to one? You will, you will be celebrated. You will prosper. You will be the best. The world will celebrate you. And if you have an amen, let me hear it like a thunder. There were a few other tests as I close. Joseph passed the test of courage. He was a man of un uncommon courage. What is a man without courage? There's no man. One of the jokes, every time I remember it, I still laugh. Told by one of the comedians. Of some people were in a luxurious bus traveling at night. And all of a sudden they stopped. And these two bazooka wielding arm robbers. Okay, everybody come out. Line up. Women on one side, men on one side. And everybody took their position. When they came to 